All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the, uh, let's see, what is it, the 20th day of September in the year of our Lord, 2024. And my, my heart is sad. I, I uh, looked this morning on the internet and I saw uh, there was something about uh, Stephen Lawson had resigned. And I'm not a follower of his. I've, I've heard several messages by him. I know he's a regular speaker at MacArthur's events out there at Grace Community Church, uh, which uh, is there sort of a mixed group as far as uh, the, the events out there. And MacArthur's gotten more and more Calvinist over the years. I had my uh, short span in, of Calvinism, and then I realized it's not biblical. It is not scriptural. It, its foundations are in Aristotle, believe it or not, indirectly, but they're in Aristotle. Indirect enough to hide it, especially for Protestants, because Luther and Calvin, they looked heavily to Augustine to justify their positions. And Augustine drank heavily from pagan philosophers before and after he was a Christian. The great Augustinian flip-flop from being strongly free will to uh, to no will at all kind of thing. Um, whereas I strongly assert that nobody is saved unless God does it. But I do not hold the Calvinist positions on many things. Especially the eternal decree of all things in exhaustive detail which is actually the death of God, if you think about it. No, I know. The, see, the God, it, see that, that's the, the root of Calvin in, in um, Aristotle is Calvin's conception of God. And it's not Calvin. It comes from the Catholic scholastics. It comes from Augustine and later uh, because they drank from Aristotle, and they use the language of Aristotle and his metaphysics in their descriptive descriptions of God. And their God is not, what the God they end up with, because it's rooted, it's a bad tree, it's rooted in bad soil, it's rooted in Aristotle. And because of that, they end up with a God that is not the God of the Bible. Uh, they're convinced it is, but... Uh, they're taken with theology and, and logic. But Christianity doesn't consist in theology and logic. It consists of Christ in you. So a little child can be born again. A little child can be a, a, as much a saint as anybody, maybe more so. But as on, I'm again, I've, I've only heard a couple of messages by uh, Stephen Lawson. I wasn't particularly attracted to him. I remember at one time at uh, a shepherd's conference event, he gave a eulogy, just a, just a well, eulogy of, of Calvin. And that was probably somewhat during my Calvinist period. <laughs> I mean, I, you just read Calvin and you realize. It's like reading Luther, you know, you, 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 these people are, are held up as great men of God. And you, you read their works, and they can be just as vain and carnal as anyone you run into on the street. And that's that. I mean, as Christians, we have three enemies we contend with. The world the flesh, and that's a big one, and the devil. 
they're, they're, the one thing that all these things prove is that the utter fallacy of the doctrine of sinless perfectionism. It is absolutely false. Just read what Wesley himself wrote. You have a man that is unstable, a man that is sinful, and could be very, very hateful and vindictive. Uh, and, and just others, even his own brother, you know, he was about ready to disown him at one time because of the way he treated his wife. He didn't want him to get married anyway, but then, then uh, near the end of his life, uh, he wrote to his brother confessing he's never been a Christian. He's been nothing but an honest pagan. Well, I don't think he's an honest pagan at all, but see, that, that's one of these problems we have is, well, Mother Teresa was the same way. She, she wrote to her confessor uh, things that she's never known Christ. And that's what I want to emphasize, the absolute necessity of truly being born again. Now, I don't know about Steve Lawson. He seemed like a pretty straight-up guy. Uh, he seemed like an honorable man, um, the little bit I know about him. He has a min ministry we call One Passion. And now if you, I tried to look it up to see what it was about, and you get a public statement. And a lot of these things now are taken down, so you can't see anything about the guy. But I did find out he is 73 years old, He's been married for 40 years, and he's got four children. How does this happen? I'll tell you. The world, the flesh, and the devil. You're never beyond temptation. Satan knows your weaknesses, and you dwell in a body of sinful flesh. And if you think you can't be tempted, you've deceived yourself. And the higher you are, in the kingdom of God, at least the more public position you have, the bigger the target is painted on your back. Satan is out to get you because he, he hopes that he can not only destroy you, but he can destroy all those people who love your ministry and put their trust in you. And that's, that's the problem. It's not just about one man. It's about those who hold too closely to a man other than Jesus Christ. The moral of this story, and I've seen so many of these things happen. I mean, you're not really surprised when it's somebody like Jim Baker or Jimmy Swaggart or a number of others. But when it's a respected minister, a person that's devoted their life to not quite sure what, uh, preaching the scriptures, expository preaching perhaps, which is what MacArthur is about, MacArthur doesn't preach the gospel very much, but he preaches the Bible and puts his interpretation on things. Which, when I listen to somebody, it's like, of course, it's, I can fault myself, too. At least on YouTube, I don't pretend I'm, I'm preaching a sermon to the church, although I might be. I might be. I don't think too many non-Christians follow me. I don't have that many followers anyway, thank God. I don't want... I don't want 100,000 people following me because I'm a man of flesh too. And sometimes I can experience intense temptation. It's not what I want. Just had an uh, event of that not too long ago, and it's like, God help me. You know, you know where it comes from. I mean, you've got the, the flesh has got an ally, but there's Satan there. And he will, will sneak up on you when you're not paying attention. And what it does, why does God allow this? So that you learn to trust in him, in Christ, not in your flesh, not in your wisdom, not in your knowledge, not in your experience, not in some man, mentor but Christ himself. So I want to take a look. I'm just going to try to do something fairly brief here for me. So let's, uh, there's a statement at One Passion uh, Ministries, which is one of his ministries. He was pastor at uh, Trinity Bible Church in Dallas, I believe. Um, 
you know, it's a well known. I mean, he's been on. He's one of the regulars at MacArthur's Church. And again, I've, if you've listened to me enough, I've, I'm not a fan of MacArthur. <laughs> he hasn't been engaged in public sca uh, scandals, but he's a man of flesh, too. And he has done some things that I find very inconsistent with, with a, a man in ministry. And plus, he has his name plastered on everything, and that... That is a bit of a tell. Uh, I don't know him personally, but you know, I'm just leery of him. I don't. I, I've have had a lot of his books. I've read them. Uh, some of them were useful a little bit, but at some point, I went back and read, looked at him again, and said, "No, no, MacArthur's just wrong. His uh, his idea of salvation is." not right but he's gone more and more calvinistic and in calvinism you don't even have a choice no but god doesn't have a choice anymore <laughs> and if you don't understand that you don't know how calvinism works it's all about the eternal decree of all things if everything's decreed even what god does is decreed he can't interact with his creatures well neither could the god of aristotle that's why you know that's that's why I say it's it's grounded in the it's rooted in Aristotle. Just go up to look look on the Wikipedia page and Aristotle's idea of dea, of God, a hypothetical God, and it's it's absolute perfection and it's out of the Platonic or the ideas the ideas of Plato as far as protection uh, perfection and then Aristotle was his student and so it's God as the perfect. But you have to understand a little bit about Plato and Aristotle and the the ideal versus the uh, uh, the natural, the 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 lower level. The higher level is the ideal, the idea, uh, like a perfect triangle. And then then you have the uh, the things that actually exist that are less than perfect. And so that was the Greek idea of perfection too, of, of that human beings. Uh, uh, the, the idea of the resurrection of the body. The Gnostics were grounded in this kind of stuff, too. The idea of the resurrection of the body is they just absolutely despise that because the body to them, matter, was imperfect, ideas, and the spirit was perfect. So the idea of the resurrection of the body is despicable to them. Or God inhabiting a human body. That was completely foreign to them, and that's obviously not what the Bible teaches. You know, you, there's all kind. You know, the Re, the Reformation slo, uh, slogans like "Sola Scriptura," they don't really mean it. It's like the uh, Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, unlike the Lutheran Church uh, Evangelical Lutheran Church of America that just threw the Bible and everything else out too, but their their uh, book of concord which is the historic confessions uh and trials and tribulations of the uh, early followers of luther so it's a historical document yeah it's not a problem as a historical document but when you have to conform to the ideas that these people that, that wasn't even luther had about different things like their ideas of of how christ is present in the in the wine and in the bread. And if you don't say it like they say it, you can't come to the Lord's table. <laughs> that was the real deal breaker for me. But, okay, yeah, uh, so it's historical. It's historical truth, you know, but that doesn't mean I have to follow it. <laughs> that could have followed Luther. I had some Lutheran write me and said, we don't worship Luther. I don't remember ever saying anybody worships Luther. His picture is probably all over in your church, though. At least it was the church I grew up, you know, the, the Sunday school uh, uh, building. You know, they had, you know, a picture of Luther on the wall and Melanchthon. I didn't know who Melanchthon was. but Oh, yeah. We called ourselves Lutherans. We didn't call ourselves Christians. <laughs> What's a Christian? There was, there was Lutherans and there was Catholics. 
Then there was also different kinds of Lutherans that we didn't have anything to do with either. Oh my, crazy. But that's see what what where does that come out of? The world, the flesh, and the devil. Denominationalism is not trusting. It's not trusting in Christ. It's trying to. It's building a tower of Babel. You know, we, we got to make it. We got to make a name for ourselves to hold ourselves together. It's like the. This is a bit of a uh, side track, but you know, rabbit trail. But that's what I do all the time. Uh, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, they've had reports out saying that uh, lots of stuff on the internet that they're going to disappear, according to their calculations, by 2040. Obviously, the now this is a Bible-believing, conservative, confessional. Uh, Lutheran Church. I was going to say Catholic, but <laughs> there's no such thing as a Bible-believing, conservative, confessional Catholic Church. No, even though if they say they would, no. <clears throat> I've I've been to enough of them, including family members. So no, no, no. The Bible is is something. <laughs> okay, you know those big Bibles the banks used to give out. About this thick, big, like a big pulpit Bible with the pictures. It was a table Bible, right? My in laws, who were my father in law and mother in law, not the kids so much, <laughs> like my wife, um, they were pretty serious Catholics. Uh, I would say they would be called good Catholics. They, they were not theologically minded or. Uh, but but they did attend church and they went to bingo and and they would buy lottery tickets. My father-in-law won a brand new car. And then sometimes they'd go take a trip to Las Vegas. And it's like it's like okay, um, none of that is really irrelevant. But uh, uh, so you know, m my father-in-law was a. Uh, uh, he had faith in the church. He had faith in the church to get him to heaven. In other words, he didn't know Christ. And I'd asked him one time, because I saw a Bible there in his, his little study, and I said, Burn, have you ever read that book? He said, of course not. <laughs> That's not something a good Catholic did, at least in that generation. That was that was that was before Vatican II, uh, but yeah. Anyway, uh, he had a little shrine to Pope John Paul II. Our shrine, or maybe a maybe a candle to pray for him. Maybe I I interpreted that wrong, but a little picture with a candle in front of it. He didn't worship John Paul II, but uh, they were good Catholics. Okay. And I, I do have a concern, though. Do, you know, the, the people like that, I don't know what the Lord's going to do with it. But Jesus said, unless you're born again, you cannot see or enter the kingdom of God. And getting baptized as an infant, or even as an adult, baptism doesn't do it. The only sacraments are not a means of grace. The only means of grace is faith in Christ. That is the means through which we receive the grace of God, which is Christ himself. Not some other thing like Mary. The reason they go to Mary is because they're afraid of Jesus. Because he's the judge. So you've got to get on his mother's good side because she'll, she'll manipulate her son. Yeah, really? So what did Jesus say to Mary when she came to him about the fact that the wedding, uh, that they'd run out of wine? He, he sort of yelled at her a little bit. He, he, he said something to her that was, Woman, what is this to, you know, what is this between you and me? And in other words, she was, she was exceeding her boundary. She, she was acting like his mother but he was the Lord Jesus Christ. He was in his ministry. And so she, she came to him for a special favor on the grounds that she was his mother. 
And that's the, what the Catholics insist that you should go to Mary on. Well, what did Jesus say to her? You know, you know, basically said, uh, you're not allowed to make those requests. Because I'm about my father's business. She was the mother of his flesh, not the mother of his deity. It, it, uh, by the way, uh, Theotokos is not as bad as mother of God. Uh, see, because Theotokos literally means that the, the, the Greek expression they brought in, and I heard James White say it was initially an expression of the deity of Christ. Because Theotokos means God-bearer, the one who carries God, carried God. And, yeah, okay. Um, but it wasn't God's, the deity of Christ confined in her womb. No, the flesh of Christ. So uh, uh, others said, well, no, no, don't say that. Say, say the Christ bearer. Yeah, but they wanted to make a statement about deity, I think, which is, I learned something now and then from James White. I don't look at him, listen to him often, but sort of like, at least on YouTube, you've got that slider, so it sometimes works, and you can skip past the first 15 minutes. Uh, you can do that with me, too, by the way. But back to to uh, to S uh, Stephen Lawson, um, you know I've I'm 69 years old now, and I've seen how many years have I been a Christian, Jeepers, uh, since 1976? 48 years, is that right? That might be wrong. 40 something. Anyway, um, yeah, it'd have to be about 48. Time flies. Where did it all go? But uh, I, I've seen, I, I can still remember, I was driving down the road between uh, Milton and Whitewater, Wisconsin, when I heard about the fall of of Jim Baker. And these things devastate Christians because they they listen to these people and especially younger Christians, they don't they don't have any experience yet. They haven't seen the reality of things and they don't know the reality of themselves yet either. And uh, the last couple of weeks, I've been seems to be a time of introspection for me, where I've been, since most of my life has passed now, my earthly life. Sixty nine, you're 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 over the hump, and halfway down, the, the far side at least. Uh, looking back, I mean, there's lots of things uh, that I regret that I, I should have done better, based on what I know now. <laughs> yeah, but I, my motives weren't usually bad, as far as I know, but still, I mean, I think of all the sermons I've preached, that I sh a lot of stuff I shouldn't have even touched. Of course, they would have probably just got rid of me quick, because that would have been Christ crucified, Christ risen from the dead, and then you gotta be, must be born again. And I did a lot of preaching that. Always is in there someplace, but all the other stuff is just a waste of time. Trying to imitate what other pastors do, what other churches do, you know, what the church expected. And not being good at some things, like not going knocking on doors which doesn't save people anyway. That's one good thing about understanding that salvation comes from God, not you. You're not responsible if people don't come to Christ. It's his burden, not yours. So 
But the scripture tells us to be ready to make a defense for the hope that was in us. It doesn't tell us to go out and knock on doors. He says, be ready. So if, if the Holy Spirit brings someone to you or brings up a Christ in a conversation or prompts you to do it knowingly, you don't have to plan on it. It just happens. Uh, be ready. Uh, let your, your speech be seasoned with salt. Let God use you. It's up to him. Okay, so Steve Lawson. Let's take a look. Okay, let's take a look at this uh, statement here. Somebody said I bloviate a lot. <laughs> You're right. Although I don't think he meant it in a... Uh, he meant it as if everything I say is nonsense, which is not true. So, just a lot of it. Okay, so here is uh, here is from the One Passion Ministry is uh, one of his ministries is probably his speaking and writing ministry. The board of One Passion Ministries mournfully announces that just recently Stephen J. Lawson confessed to the board that he had had. He has had an inappropriate relationship with a woman. In other words, adultery. He, is, he has a wife. He's been married for 40 years. Not second marriage. Four children. Okay, so I've actually been married. I'm younger than him. He is 73. I've been married longer than him. I've been married 45 years. Long enough that I have to use the calculator. All right, so you'd think that that wouldn't be a problem. What does the scripture say? Why is an elder or a deacon supposed to be the husband of one wife? For several reasons, but one, you know, a man should be married because of temptation. Uh, sexual desire can be a powerful force, even if you're 73 years old especially if a young woman comes along and tells, starts telling you how wonderful you are and uh, you start feeling like a young man again. Beware. Okay, l let me say something on that subject. And again, just being older doesn't mean you're immune from temptation uh, or that you don't have to be watchful. There's uh, yeah. uh I, I didn't try to find any details about this uh, other than what it says, and uh, there's no reason for that. Uh, he's disqualified from from uh, positions of responsibility from elder or deacon, biblically disqualified, and he knows that, I'm sure. Uh, unlike the charismatics and Pentecostals, which try to rehabilitate you. Now, that doesn't mean he's useless. In fact, this very incident, his fall, uh, I can I can imagine that would be a grounds uh, something that you could warn pastors about, warn men about, or women uh, about uh, whatever it was that led him that 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 Satan used as a hook to get him into that. And it happened to David, but uh, again, we're in these bodies, even as born-again Christians, which is we have an advantage over David, we still are in these bodies of flesh, sinful flesh. We're still subject to temptation. And uh, we can start thinking we're beyond that, and that's... Uh, Again, I thank God that for the last couple of weeks we're looking back over this stuff. And let me say this about that. That when you realize that uh, everything you've done is nothing but dust. Again, salvation is of the Lord. And your life is, you know, sort of a waste. You look at it, judge it. I'm judging myself here, uh, which doesn't prove it necessarily is true, but uh, I don't know. God has to judge that. I, I don't know the effects. My, as far as I know, my preaching didn't 
you know, other than people saying you you sold you told me exactly what I need to hear or or things like that. But I I don't like praise because I think it's dangerous. To me, it's dangerous. I I no, don't tell me I'm wonderful. Tell me how wonderful Jesus is. What Jesus has done for you. God forbid that people look to me as their savior, because I'm not. I'm a man of dust. That has the spirit of the Lord in him, but okay. So let's let's look at this. So uh, he's resigned from all his duties. All scheduled events and engagements have been canceled. Okay, he he confessed and regrets the damage he has done to his family, the church, and reputation of One Passion Ministries, and most of all to Jesus Christ. We are saddened for the glory of Christ in this matter. Let me say this about that, and it's something I've learned. It's like, in my own life, it's not about my glory, it's about His glory. Jesus, God is glorified in the salvation of sinners. That, in Christ, Christ is the glory of God, and Christ came to save sinners. That's what glorifies God. That he saves wretches like me, sinners like me. So the fact that we demonstrate that we still live in sinful bodies does not diminish his glory at all. Because it's not about our works, it's about what he did on the cross. And looking at my own life and Lawson's life, Lawson's failure does not diminish the glory of what Jesus did on the cross. He is not glorified by our works. He's glorified by his works. You got that. That is so important. We, we're not, you know, what did Paul say? I'm the worst of sinners. Was he? No. But still, he's, we dwell in sinful bodies. And the kingdom of God does not depend on us. It depends on God. It depends on the cross. It depends on Christ. So no matter what our failures are, Christ is glorified in saving sinners like us. You got that. And still working to save sinners like us. He doesn't discard us. Might say, well, you can't be in that position. Well, for Pete's sakes, Lawson is 73 years old anyway. About time he retires. Go fishing or something. But he could have a useful ministry warning people, you know, depending on the circumstances, I said, you might be 73 years old. You might think you got it all nailed down. You might think you're beyond temptation. You got a lovely family, a lovely wife. So you know I mean? And some uh, nice, sweet girl comes along, young lady, and says, oh, you're so wonderful. Oh, I wish I had a man like you. <laughs> Your ego is going, bunka, bunka, bunka. <laughs> so, yeah. You start feeling alive again, you know. Here's this young lady, she's attracted to me. Danger, danger. I suspect it was something like that. Uh, uh, it depends on the nature of something. I, it, if, if it was something that was going on for a long time. He actually, the sermon, I saw a clip from a sermon he preached right before, the Sunday before he resigned. And he was preaching about adultery. And it's like, how could this man stand up in front of the church and preach on this subject without just breaking down in, in, in tears himself? I don't know. I, you know, what did Adam and Eve do when they sent? Hid, hid, tried to cover their sin, right? Ran away from God. Uh it says here, the truth of the gospel will continue to go out to the lost world as it is empowered by the Holy Spirit and not by man. True. It is a reminder that we have been warned of the craftiness of the enemy. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Uh, I can put that on the screen for you there. Uh, for, for your adversary, the devil, 
adversary, Satan, Satan actually means adversary, too, uh, prowls around as a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he can tempt you. He can arrange for it. Okay, so... Again, Christ's glory is not diminished when we fail. Because he came to save sinners. That This is a reason to understand, too, that sinless perfectionism is a false doctrine. And Wesley proves it. Wesley, John Wesley's life proves the falseness of that doctrine. And I've, I've been around holiness people. And I dearly love them in some ways. I mean, they're usually very nice people. But, well, Southern Fundamental Baptists can be the same way. There's a certain stiffness to them. Because they... And I have a fear that they may actually be lost. Because if you're standing, as Wesley taught, at least at some times, but he was so inconsistent. You know, depends what Wesley you're listening to. But uh, Charles Finney, uh, one of the people that Billy Graham was really, was thought great, a great preacher, was uh, not Wesleyan, but he was holiness too and had the same doctrine that you must stand before God in your own righteousness. Well, if you have to stand in your own righteous, your going, righteousness, you are going to hell because you fall short of the glory of God. If you don't measure up to the fullness of the stature of Christ, you fall short of the image of God, which is what you're created to be. Now, the new creation in you doesn't fall short, but your flesh does. So it's, a, uh, it's an object lesson to everybody, all Christians. And it's absolutely necessary. So, oh, oh yeah, I was going to show you, so you get an idea of what Lawson was into here. So I looked to uh, the Amazon to see what books he's written. And uh, let's take a look over here. So I don't think he was a bad guy by any means. Uh, I don't know him personally. I haven't listened to him much. But it'll cost you everything. What it takes to follow Jesus. Yeah, it, it does cost you everything, even though it costs you nothing. You don't have to have anything to follow Jesus. In fact, the less possessions you have, the better off you are. Uh, because when you come to Christ and kneel to him, he becomes your Lord, and everything is yours conditionally. Your possessions belong to him, right? You get all his possessions, and he gets all yours. So if he says, sell that, and I want you to do this, or I want you to move someplace— and it's really the Lord doing it. Uh, you, you might go, ah, 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 yes, sir, whatever you say. Uh, and that's it. I mean, if he's, if you don't confess Jesus as your Lord, well, you're not saved. You don't have to accept him as your Lord in order to be saved. But it's a fruit of salvation. It's a fruit of, of him giving you a new heart, of pouring out the love of God in you. So you're willing to do that. Yes, we can get tangled in the things of the world, too, and sometimes we got to disentangle ourselves. But if God says, do this, and you love him, you'll do it. You do it out of love, not out of uh, trying to earn things, because all our obedience, all our righteousness is still as filthy rags. It's always contaminated. I had a person say something to me, and they said uh, something about... Yeah, but my motives aren't pure. There's, 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 I have mixed motives about it. I said, we all do. We all do. The flesh is going to have its motive, and the Spirit of God in you is going to have that motive. And it was something good, okay? So, but it, you know, but it's a, your flesh is going to twist it, and it's going to want to use it for itself. It'll come up re with reasons. Well, I should do this because it'll be to my advantage in this way trying to justify compliance. <laughs> that's your flesh. That, that's not going to leave this world with you, though. So that, that, that will be a good thing. It's better to 
to to depart and be with the Lord than to be here. That's boy, that's been an obvious thing in the last couple of days or the last couple of weeks. It's like, please. Now we have all of us have some responsibilities here, but uh, it's like, oh man, Christ just come and then it's, you know. It's, this world is just so oppressive and entangling in in everything. It got it's, it gets its roots and its hooks into everything. Your life on so many different levels. So let's look at these titles. Uh, uh, it'll cost you everything to follow Jesus. Okay. Yeah, it's true, but it's it's not in a bad sense, and it's not something that, that's just really a struggle because God changes your heart and He pours out His love in you. For God, so it's it's that new creation that that if you're born again, it's not really that trouble uh, much for trouble. So it's like, say if if God uh, Satan had you crucified, God will enable you to do that, to to endure that. If he if 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 if, if he uh, decides to to honor Christ with the testimony of your blood, with a martyr, as a witness, who knows how many Christians were crucified? Some recently, in various places. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It'll be less of a problem for you than it was for Jesus, who bore the sins of the whole world upon him. You don't have to bear sins on your cross at all. Jesus has already carried the load. You're just going home in a few hours. All right. Show me your glory. Understanding the maj majestic splendor of God. I don't know. Uh, Stephen Lawson is a, a Calvinist, so I'm not quite sure what he's talking about there. Um, again, but th none of these books look, I mean, compared to something you'd find uh, uh, J uh, Joel uh, Osteen, you know, your best life now, you know, right, uh, in your face, a carnality. Your best life now, not in heaven now. It's like, wow. So it's only going to get worse after you die. That's what he's saying. Stephen uh, J. Lawson, uh, forward by MacArthur. Okay, the most of the books don't have his name in big letters like this, um, which is a good thing. Foundations of Grace. Mm, he's a Calvinist. I know what that probably means. Uh, Pillars of Grace. Uh, it says, uh, I should actually read the thing, a long line of godly men. Okay, also pillars of grace, a long line of godly men, 100 A.D. to 1564. Uh, called to preach the daring mission of William Tyndale, the first, uh, who published the first printed English New Testament, which was a death penalty offense. He was hunted down and uh, executed by the Church of England, basically. He was out of the country, and they deceived him and got a hold of him, and he was burned at the stake for printing New Testaments. And he's told his New Testament was so good that most of the New Testament, the King James, is taken from Tyndale's work. <laughs> Uh, so in Spanish, it'll cost you everything. New life in Christ. Uh, what really happens when you're born again and why it matters? Okay. Uh, Sinclair Ferguson, too. Uh, he's in a little bit of hot water now, too. Um, I don't know what... I think he's gone even farther. I haven't been following these guys. But he did get in hot water with many people in suggesting that if you have a... Uh, if you're invited to a gay marriage, you should go and bring a gift. There, there is worse sins. I mean, it depends on the motive of your heart. 
if you're doing it out of love and a concern and, and trying to get an opportunity, I think he also mentioned, perhaps if you don't want to do that, you can invite them, the couple over to your house for dinner. If it's out of love for Christ and love for their salvation, it is not sinful. It is not sinful. But you have to be careful at what you're doing because and don't think according to your own wisdom. These things are, there's no hard and fast rules with this stuff. Uh, how you interact with an individual, you have to be led by the Spirit. And that is not getting a, uh, a memo or a text message in the morning from the Holy Spirit saying, this is exactly what you're going to do today, and this is exactly what you're going to say, and don't worry, you don't have to remember any of this because just push this button, I do it all. Uh, God's not going to give you advance warning, okay? And if you try to plot it out and come up with a plan, it's coming from you and it's not coming from God. So uh, the gospel focus of Charles Spurgeon, oh, the, the expository genius of John Calvin, that, that's, you know, he did a eulogy on Calvinism. It was like, oh, Calvin. Well, uh, John Calvin is not a great exegete. No. No, he's not. I, I don't know where they get that from. You know, I've just been reading the Bible too long to be impressed by anybody's opinions. I'm not impressed by these guys in the shelf. I don't care the best of them, you know, like, oh, who is, uh, Bovink, I think of the commentators, the Calvinist commentators, like, Bovink would probably be the best. Certainly don't want Turretin. He's just a polemicist. It's like, like, uh, uh, what is that, a 17th century J.D. Hall. Uh, and what's the other one I've got there? Uh, Hodge? No. There's a man who likes Latin and doesn't provide an English translation for it. Uh, he was a, that was a standard seminary work until, who, who replaced it? I can't remember. Gruden? No. Geisler? No, he's, uh, uh, there was one other that I thought was pretty decent. Not that I necessarily recommend it, but compared to the others. Uh, New Systematic Theology of the Christian Faith by Dr. Robert L. Raymond. Um, definitely not an extremist and not dry wood. A lot of theology is simply dead wood. Old, dead, wormy wood. <laughs> How do I know about that? I just removed a very, very, very large stump. <laughs> okay, so none of these uh, famine in the land, Spurgeon, I'm not a big fan of Spurgeon. I got his volumes. I don't read them. He's pretty wordy. <laughs> what? what? Here's a pot calling the cattle black. Um, preaching the psalm. So it's, his one passion appears to be preaching the scriptures. Uh, which is, I think is what it usually does. He goes into a lot of Christian history, too. Jonathan Edwards, uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones. Of those two, I prefer Jones over Edwards. Jonathan Edwards, if you like to think, he'll make your brain smoke. However, his sermons are not... They're like showing off his intellect. You get Edwards' intellect rather than the Word of God. That's that's a problem. As, as the Scripture says, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Uh, so, but I don't see anything bad here. Uh, George Whitfield, I don't see anything on his friend. Uh, hmm... The Great Awakening. Wesley and Whitfield. Wesley was an Arminian and Whitfield was a Calvinist. <sighs> but they didn't. They went to school together. They, they weren't enemies, but the, the hymn. What was the hymn? 
that Wesley hated a hymn and the author. And it was, uh, the author was Top Lady, and the hymn is Rock of Ages, which is a beautiful, wonderful hymn. One of the greatest hymns there is. Speaking of Christ, and see, Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. And it's all about salvation through faith in Christ and being hidden in Christ, being covered in Christ. But what Christ did on the cross for us. Wesley hated that. Because there's a line in there. I think there's a, there's a, there's a line in that hymn that says, Nothing in my hands I bring. Only to thy cross I cling. In other words, the cross of Christ and Christ crucified is our only hope. We don't bring our own offering. We cling to God's offering. Unless you want to be like Cain. So, yeah, uh, it's a, it's a, it, it's like a, a punch in the gut when you see this. And even though I, you know, I'm not a follower of, of, of Lawson uh, or of John MacArthur, but uh, uh, MacArthur has other issues for me um, that I've mentioned in videos past. And he's almost out of saying, I, I understand uh, that he was hospitalized. I don't know if he's out, but he's like 85 years old, uh, fluid around his heart, you know. That's called dying of old age. <laughs> what is the Bible? You know, uh, 70 or if reason by of strength, 80. So when you're past 80, you're definitely past the shelf expiration date, you know. There's things that can, you can eat even after they're two or three years out of, out of date, you know, the can. But it doesn't get better with age. Uh, and uh, as is true about certain politicians and global leaders and candidates, I think there should be an upper limit of 80. It seems that after that, things can get problematic suddenly. Now, uh, but, you know, there's certainly worse, worse characters out there than MacArthur. MacArthur MacArthur's Gospels is troubling in some ways, and, and his, his stories are, he's, he's come up with some pretty far-fetched stories. So there's some issues there, but but compared to somebody like Joel Osteen or Pope Francis or, you know, Pope Francis just an out-and-out -out uh, pagan and doesn't even deceive most Catholics anymore. But uh, Joel Osteen deceives multitudes because his gospel is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a gospel of the flesh. Have your best life now. Just, just look up on Google Earth get the the upper view of these these preachers houses you can find them get their home address you can find it just search on the internet and just get a top view of all these especially these charismatic preachers see if they live in a house that be like Jesus would live in or are they in love with stuff with fancy houses, with pools and cars, and, and a private compound, and yeah, would they live in a mobile home? Would they be trailer trash? Would they live in a tent, a shack, a hole in the ground? Where they have no place to lay their head. 
I've known lots of people that would. because they love Jesus more than anything else. I wish I knew a lot more people like that. I hope you come to know Christ like that. That the things of this world are not important. You realize they're just dust. And you're so full of love for Christ that temptation recedes into the background. You don't love the world, nor the things of the world. Because of the love of the Father has been poured out in you through his Spirit. 